Welcome to the January 2015 meeting of Americans for Prosperity. Uh, our speaker tonight is Jeff Krupp. Many of you, some of you know him. He is connected with Oregon Citizens Lobby, and the other entity is... Oregon Capital Watch Foundation. Oregon, Oregon Capital Watch Foundation. A former member of the Oregon Legislature, definitely knows what's going on in Salem and around the state. Uh, he's going to be talking with us this evening about the OCL program. Um, have, is, is there anybody else here that has been involved with it in the past? so far as being a volunteer and reviewing pending legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good website. Okay, there's three, four, five. Very good. Um, I think it's a wonderful program. You're gonna learn things about it tonight you may not know. The whole idea is educating the public more, analyzing the bills to see what really is in them, helping the legislature to understand them and helping our fellow citizens, hopefully fellow voters, to understand them and make intelligent decisions about which ones to support and which ones to oppose. So let me turn the meeting over to Jeff Krupp. And Thank welcome. you, Tom. Great to be with you tonight. It's, uh, it's good to be with my fellow patriots uh, down here. I'm. Uh, Jeff Krupp, recovering politician in a 12-step program. <laughs> I'm not really sure where I am yet because I'm still stuck in the political world. So um, tonight I want to share with you about how you can make an even greater difference uh, from sitting in front of your computer, even in your pajamas, if that's what you want to do. How you can influence the legislature. Uh, in perhaps an even more profound way. And that's what the Oregon Citizen Lobby seeks to do. The Oregon, let me just give a brief history of the Oregon Citizen Lobby. We kind of started in, in 2010, when I was still the State Director of Americans for Prosperity, uh, we decided to do what was called a war room. And this is an idea I took from my Georgia uh, colleague who uh, was the Georgia State Representative for AFP. And she, uh, she did a war room at the Capitol and all these other activist groups came together and, and they were lobbying legislators on issues that they really cared about and, and it made a big difference. So we decided to do it and so in 2010 we did our very first uh, war room and then when the 2012 um, first, I think that was our first constitutional session, um, I can't remember if that was one of the special sessions or if we changed the constitution then, but anyway we started uh, the war room as the Oregon Citizen Lobby uh, in 2012. And there were really four main uh, people that did that. It was the late activist Wayne Brady out of Salem, uh, Carla K. Edwards, who was uh, my replacement, as you know, with uh, AFP, Tom Stutzman of Salem 912 Project, and then myself at Capital Watch. And what we decided to do was to, to expand the opportunity for people not just to come to the war room, because we were hearing from people saying, look, I, I live across the state. I can't drive once a week, which is how often we meet in the war room. I can't drive there, but I want to be a part of this. It sounds really interesting. That then gave way to us really thinking it through. How could we create a better opportunity? How could we use the techniques that the left use? in how they come together, all of their groups, and this is one of the most interesting things, if you've never been to the Capitol, you should, you should come sometime to visit and watch how these lefty progressive organizations uh, will, whether they're one or two people and they have a name or they're, you know, 500 people, they all coalesce around some of these socialist progressive ideas. And they'll put out a, uh, a communique that's this big long list of names and organizations and it sounds very impressive and they come together at the Capitol and they literally lobby at the Capitol and we saw how effective they were because it you know, legislators will pay attention when all these groups are coming there and saying all saying the same thing and nobody else is saying it from our side then it really does make an impact on them so we watched what they were doing we think we've got to do that we've got to fight fire with fire we've got to learn from what they're doing and even try to do it better. And so 
we decided one of the ways we could do it better is to put together a website. In fact, we have two websites, and I'll share them with you uh, tonight, about how people can, from their home, from you guys down here in the Medford area, Grants Pass, wherever, Klamath Falls, you can sit in front of your, of your computer, and you can be very effective at helping the legislature, as Tom alluded to, helping them understand your perspective on different types of legislation. So that, that's what I want to share with you tonight is about how that process works, how you can go to our two different websites and you can get trained on your own because we have training videos on YouTube that are very helpful. There's written stuff that you can um, read there also in terms of training modules and then how you can go to the actual website and get signed up and I'll log in and I'll show you how you can track actual legislation and be a part of a committee. So my goal is to share with you the opportunity tonight. Hopefully those of you uh, who are interested in partaking of that can. You can sign up at the sign-up sheet in the back or up here if you want. Uh, we have the Oregon Citizen Lobby little brochures. So this document here, of course, is the Declaration and the Constitution. And I tend to go through mine and highlight portions of it that I think are important for me to remember. And what's interesting is that sometimes my former colleagues in the House and the Senate forget what this really is and what it guarantees for us. And that's part of our purpose, is to be able to remind them by us coming together and standing on core principles. So one of the things that we decided we needed as an Oregon Citizen Lobby is a set of core principles. And that's what these are right here. I'll use my handy dandy. Fiscal responsibility, local control, free markets, limited government, personal choice, and responsibility. And, and these were because some of us are libertarians, some are conservative Republicans like me, uh, even some conservative Democrats, by the way, as part of the OCL, have in the, these were a set of core principles that we felt clearly were were well within the guidelines and the intent of the Constitution. So these are the core principles we came up with. And then we came up with the technology, the opportunity to, that I'm going to demonstrate to you in a little bit. And what's interesting is that every year, this will be our third year doing this, every year more people come to us, more people get involved. And this is our first year actually going out across the state and uh, there's another event like this happening in Eugene at Eugene 912 tonight. Uh, where we're presenting the opportunity to get involved to that, that core group of people too. We, put, we have put out a legislative scorecard over the last two sessions uh, as how we rank uh, legislators, Republican and Democrat, based on these, how they voted on, on legislation judged by these five core principles. And what's interesting is that that caused a little stir, uh, especially some, uh, among some of my conservative uh, lawmakers because some of them weren't rated very highly like they thought they should have been which and, and I'll share with you why that is because our website trackthervote.org lists every bill they signed their name to not just every bill that gets voted but every bill they signed their name to and that gets counted in the score because what a time-honored principle of smoke and mirrors in the legislative process is that you sponsor or co-sponsor legislation that you know is not going to go anywhere, but you do it, hold up your hand and say you did it, okay? And sometimes that works against you, especially if you're kind of representing yourself at home to be something different than you are at say how you vote and what you do. So during the, an example of these five core principles, and us holding fast to them was the grand bargain. Remember that from 2013, where we got some PERS reforms, we got small business tax cuts, a good thing, but we also got a whole lot of tax increases on C corporations, on smokers, uh, tax increases on uh, elderly people who maybe had a little more money than elderly people who didn't quite. And so we opposed the grand bargain not, the, not because we opposed tax cuts, because we, we believe in tax cuts for small business specifically, because we, we oppose 
the idea of a $409 million tax increase, which is what it was. Oh, and did I mention that the tax increases happened two years before the tax cuts started? And we also opposed it because we know that the people in power were likely going to be the Democrats and we had a Democrat governor, and we knew that they would try to unwind the tax cuts as quickly as they can. The tax cuts just came into effect January 1 of this month of 2015, and the Democrats already are introducing legislation to unwind the tax cuts. So even more importantly, the PERS savings in it were good things, okay? However, did they use the PERS savings to really reduce the liability of PERS, long-term liability? No. They used it to grow government, to hire more state employees. Now, nothing wrong with that, I guess, if you truly, truly need them, but I can tell you from personal experience that we could make state government in some agencies a lot smaller, and we would be better off and more efficient, and we would be served, and we taxpayers would save money. So we literally stood on these five principles and opposed the grand bargain for those reasons. And even though we added our voice to some other conservatives, we weren't quite successful in doing that. But the point is, is that we stood at the legislature and we went and we lobbied legislators in the war room and people wrote in and looked at the individual bills and made analysis of them and came to the same conclusions we did that some of this was not good policy. So we stood on our principles and we did the right thing, okay? So what I, what I hope to share with you tonight is as we grow stronger, because there are more of us, and we, as we become more effective, because more of us are participating from our home computer, looking into these bills and analyzing them based on our life's experience or our our hobby or our passion of what we believe based on those five core principles we will get noticed more. In fact, today I was looking online and uh, there was a PolitiFact story in the Oregonian about a tweet that went out uh, by Bill Dewey, by the way, on uh, proposed gun legislation, Second Amendment. And the only reason that they did, the PolitiFact did that is because they wanted to prove us wrong. But the point is that the Oregon Citizen Lobby had never been on anybody's radar screen before. And here's PolitiFact out of the Oregonian, you know, giving us our due and saying, well, they're half right on this one and they're wrong on this one and they admitted it. Okay, there's an example of where us coming together as a group of people committed to core principles can make a difference in terms of standing for what we believe, because we're not alone on many of these issues. So that's my, my goal tonight is, is I, I hope I present to you uh, an easily understandable pathway for you to be even more effective. And I want to start first with going to the Oregon Citizens Lobby website. And by the way, feel free any of you to stop me at any point in time if you want to ask a question about something that I'm talking about here, okay? So Oregon Citizens Lobby website and it's citizens as in plural, because if you do Oregon Citizen Lobby, it, it, won't, uh, it won't come up uh, that way. So just go OregonCitizensLobby.org. So the website talks about how you can volunteer, training, action alerts, events, facts, fables, uh, Twitter brigade, how you can contact us, and some of the press releases. So I'll just briefly show you a little bit about this website. You can volunteer here how you can get involved in our mission and our principles, uh, which is there. Training is very, very important. We'll get to that in a moment. And then our action alerts. These are our committees where you can, based on your interest or your passion or your life's experience, you can choose to be on a committee, and it's totally your choice, and you'll be uh, assigned a bill to review for you to analyze based on our five core principles uh, and I will show you how to do that. Uh, and so if, you, if you're maybe a retired teacher and you choose to be on the education committee, so any bill that has to do with education in the House or Senate will automatically uh, be put in front of you. And you have the opportunity then to go through that bill 
read through it, and then judge it on, against our five core principles, make comments, and tell us whether it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and the degree, how, if it's a bad, if it's a thumbs down, how bad of a thumbs down is it? On a scale of one to 10, is it a two, not, not so bad, or is it a 10, really bad? Okay, so I'll get into all of that here in a moment. So those are the committees. And then under training, we'll click on that as it's connected. I am connected, or at least I was. It's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. And it's still thinking. Give it a few minutes, it's a bad connection here in the library. So, what we have on this website is we have a lot of the training videos, which are just YouTube videos, they're very short, usually two to four minutes in length. And they show you how to do everything uh, that I'm going to uh, talk about tonight. Uh, it's all pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Uh, they're easy to watch, and if it'll ever come up, well, I tell you what. So here it comes. Here it comes. All right. Just a little slow. All right. So let me scroll down here just briefly. Okay, so you've got training documents here, how to read a bill, how to lobby, how to, a little bit, bit of an advanced lobbying guide, how to testify, and that's very similar to this. The difference is, this is the state's website about how to do that, which is great, there's good stuff there. This is what we put together some years ago at AFP about how to testify uh, in front of a committee, or really how to, talk also to your legislator that's really based on interpersonal communications. When you're testifying in front of any public body, there's really four things you need to do that are really important for you to make an impact, especially if you only have a couple of minutes, is tell them who you are and why you're there. I'm Jeff Krupp, former state representative, and I'm here to oppose uh, House Bill 2800 that funds the big light rail bridge across the Columbia uh, for several billion dollars that steals money away from me down in, in Medford. Second thing you want to tell them is based on what principle. Principles still mean things. I know we think some of our friends on the left don't care about principles and often they don't because they really don't care too much about this. But many of them do and many of them are willing to listen to the principled argument. So if you make the principled argument I'm doing this because I believe it is bad policy that is only benefiting a, the large metropolitan area and it's leaving me and my fellow constituents who are paying gas taxes without the appropriate funding because the next 20 years you're going to be taking all of our tax dollars to pay the bonds for that one project. And then you tell a personal story. So if, if you have a personal story to talk about that particular issue, then you tell it to them. And make it short, but it can have a very powerful impact. I know I did this uh, when I was talking, uh, testifying on in front of the state police, or actually not in front of the state police, but in favor of uh, increasing their patrol budget uh, because my niece was killed uh, by a drunk driver uh, 20 mile, or seven miles east of Bend on Highway 20, uh, two days before Thanksgiving, about uh, 2006. And I talked about that from a very personal, because that's the closest thing I'll ever have to a daughter. Okay? And so I told that personal story, and it, and it made an impact on them. That's the third thing you want to do. First thing, tell them who you are, why you're there. Tell them why you, you believe the way you do based on principle. Tell a personal story, because that makes a human connection and impact in their soul in their mind, and then the fourth thing you do is you ask them to do something. So in this case, I ask that Ways and Means Subcommittee to pass the increased funding out of the general fund for the state patrol so that somebody else wouldn't lose their uh, niece the way I did. 
That's, what, that's the kind of thing that we give you. Now, right here, this is sample testimony. And these are from actual uh, sample testimonies that we put together in the war room so that members who came to us as we were watching the bill literally could go take that and go sit down in front of a committee and sign up and testify. And, and that's what this is right here. So we've got uh, great training documents. We've got sample testimony that gives you uh, a great, if you've never done that before, it gives you some kind of roadmap as to how to do it. So does this right here. So does this. Uh, these are the bill ratings and voting records. And if you click on that, that'll take you to uh, track their vote, and that's that's not as clear as it should be, and we're going to fix that. Uh, and we'll talk about track their vote in, in a minute. This is really the important stuff here. I have found this to be so helpful. These are these YouTube videos that show you how easy it is to do this stuff. Now, let me just quickly play you uh, how to join OCL YouTube video, which, by the way, is on the front page, uh, right in the middle where it says how to get involved. And this is the YouTube video. I don't have. Hmm. It's not coming off my, not coming off of you. Anyway. So what he's doing is he's showing you literally how to get signed up and be a part of the Oregon Citizen Law. And, and when you do that, you're, uh, you'll indicate uh, what you're interested in, and then someone will contact you and will we'll put you uh, in a committee that you want to be, uh, be a part of if you want to help uh, do bills. Again, it's, uh, this is a, like a five minute video that shows you uh, how to do all this stuff, how to get signed up. This is actually on the front page there. Join the team. What activities would you like to volunteer in? What committees do you want to serve on? Education, energy, health care. You want to write emails to legislators? You want to write letters to the editors? You want to testify for bills? You want to be on the Twitter brigade? Any of you do Twitter? Tweet? Good. If you want to do that, that's how we got in PolitiFact, because we were tweeting that particular day. Okay? And these are some of our tweets up here on the right-hand side. And of course, we have a Facebook page also. So anyway, that, that's an example of, of one of the videos. And all the videos uh, play like that, where someone is demonstrating and showing to you how simple it is to do these things. And it's being narrated, and you'll be able to uh, hear that. So. This is your most important page because it, it really gives you uh, the, the background and the confidence to be effective at what we're doing. Now, no, nothing's ever as effective in life as than doing it, right? Okay, because you can get all the, you can read about it all you want until you actually go out and do it. Uh, it, it comes to a whole new level. And it really does cement uh, in your mind and in your soul what it is that you're doing and how to do it and how important it is. So. The training documents and the resources, again, uh, these two are state uh, websites that will show that to you. And then we show you how to go to the state websites and determine a bill's status, uh, if you want to know what it is. What's the difference between an A engrossed uh, bill or just an introduced bill that never gets out of committee? Those types of things are, are all explained there. So then let's go to track their vote. So if you go back here and you click on bill ratings and voting records, it's going to bring up this website right here. It's going to bring up track their vote. So when you, and of course I'm logged in, so let me log out. There we go. All right. So th this is what will show up on your screen. So you can, you can click this and you can, the average person who doesn't want to be a member of the OCL can still go here and legislators go here and they look at how we rate their bills because uh -huh. now uh, we've, we've caused them some pain uh, or some pleasure because some of them were rated a little higher, including some Democrats than 
what you would have thought, okay? So there's track a legislator, track a bill, track a session, join alerts, log in if, you're, if you've gone through that other process of joining OCL, and then about, which was the, uh, the five core principles. So let's just look at this. And by the way, there are two videos that show you how to do this uh, in depth. And especially if you are a member and you have your login and you want to analyze bills. It, it takes you through all of that process. So select, track a legislator, select a session. So let's say you wanted to track Sal Esquivel in 2014, all right? I'll tell you a funny story about Sal when I first met him. Okay, so he's, he's in the house, right? Okay, and so we're gonna select, and we're gonna find Esquivel right there. And, okay, so this is his information, right? And then if you scroll down, you'll see this. Correctly voted no on this bill, which grants total control of K-16 education to the government bureaucracy. And again, all of these bills were judged on our five core principles. Okay, someone analyzed it, maybe more than one person analyzed it, and this is what they came up with. Correctly voted yes on this bill. Sunsetting, extends a sunset of a tax credit for the return of a crop donation. So you can just, you can just see, incorrect, incorrectly voted on that, thumbs up, thumb down, so you go through these are the bills that Sal voted on that we analyzed. Now, he voted on a lot more bills than that, right? Because they'll vote on close to 1,000 bills in a legislative session. That's not unusual. I remember times where, uh, you know, you're supposed to read the bills before you vote on them, right? So I would try to take a stack of bills home with me the night uh, before the day we were going to vote on them. And I'd have, towards the end of the session, you get 50 or 60 bills, 70 bills. That you're going to spend most of the day on the floor voting and debating and that kind of thing. It's impossible to read them all. You just, you don't have enough hours in the day and your brain gets fried and, and so forth. So we, however, we looked at these bills because these were bills that we felt were really important for us based on our core principles uh, to look at. So... Every legislator gets that treatment from us based on how we reviewed on our five core principles the bills that we were tracking. Not every bill they voted on, but the ones that we were tracking. So there's a pre-selection before they're put out for the person who raised them to, to select them? We, we look at, a, a great question, um, this system is hooked directly into the state's system. So when, a, like the bills that were introduced yesterday, they're all in this system right now. Um, now, we track the bills that, that we, an, we try to analyze bills that we think are going somewhere. So we have uh, team leaders. Uh, so like if you're on the education committee, there's a team leader for the education committee, there's one for the transportation committee, one for the veterans and so forth. And they're going to look at those bills, and they're going to look at the ones that are scheduled to actually be heard in a committee. Because sometimes, when I was a committee chairman, there were some bills that my Democrat members and other ones introduced got assigned to my committee that I just was not going to have a hearing on because I wasn't going there. Okay, And that's the power you have as a committee chair to literally not hear a bill at all under any circumstances. So. Those bills that we determined are actually going to go somewhere are the bills that actually then are uh, put in front of analyzers on a particular committee. So you may have, there may be 20 or 30 uh, education bills that were introduced Monday, and maybe another five more today. The ones that, that was, 
we'll, the team leader will read through them real quick and you know read the quick synopsis summary of the bill and if it sounds like it's something that we've really got to pay attention to they'll flag it and then they'll go ahead and assign it into uh, however many people are on their their committee some committees have more people than others and sometimes we ask people to double up on committee assignments because we need more analyzers and that's one of the reasons that we're out here is because we need more analyzers because uh, not all the bills that we would like to analyze got analyzed and we want to be able to do that so yeah we'll we'll put those bills in front of people uh, we don't typically analyze bills that legislators sign on to that they introduce that they know are not going anywhere okay all right we typically don't do that unless somebody really gets a, you know a burr under our saddle and we we want to make an example of it and then we'll look at all of their bills and you can you can track every one of Sal's bills so you can track a bill by session by 2014 you can track let's say house bills that's what HB stands for HCR is house concurrent resolution SB is Senate bill uh, all those have have meanings uh, to them but let's say uh, an HB and let's just I'm just gonna take a bill off the shelf here and we'll just take 4015 select the bill version we'll select the B engrossed so I'll just briefly explain this and again this is this is covered in all the trainings in a bill that's introduced is typically not the bill that gets voted on and passed into law or not uh, usually you know, most legislation gets amended for a numbers of reasons the bill that actually gets signed into law is going to be the one with the highest alphabetical number and it'll say engrossed which means that it's it's a done deal okay so the a there was an a engrossed version the b engrossed version meant that for whatever reason they had to amend the a engrossed one and they had to go back and fix something in it so a engrossed version so you can create a printable page there because again this is tied into the state system so everything you're seeing here you could go on the state's website and find for yourself we just try to make it real easy so that you can do it in one place okay so uh, when it says this bill hasn't been published yet that means we the OCL no one has reviewed this bill yet okay because if it's reviewed then it'll say it's been published okay so I I wouldn't be able to show you whether we have a thumbs up or thumbs down on this piece of legislation I just would not okay so th there's an example of how you can just go there you can track a legislator you can track a bill you can track a session right here and again you can go to 2014 and you can see how we rated people okay so scores are based on how legislators voted and sponsored legislation larger scores better so keep in mind that a minus 10 is better than a minus 20 okay so these are um, these are senators and they're all Republicans there's a Democrat and again these are bills that we analyzed that this person this senator voted on again we scored it based on our five criteria and how we analyze legislation so th this is what causes some grief for some of, of our members and uh, like Fred, Fred is, is my state senator. When I left the House, uh, he came in and, and was elected behind me and then he became the state senator. I know Fred really well. He's my dentist. Yes, seriously. He's a very conservative guy. I mean, he's a very conservative guy, but his votes on 
quite a few pieces of legislation that we analyzed, put him down here, whereas uh, Brian and Bill Hansel, Bill Hansel is from Pendleton, longtime county commissioner over there. He's a moderate. It, he's not exactly what you would call a conservative, all right? But because he voted right on a number of bills that we analyzed based on our five core principles, he got a higher rate, which I'm still, there's Herman Bertziger, okay? One of the most conservative guys you can, you know, know, period. And he got a pretty good score. So it's, again, this is, this is how we rate people, and this is what causes like I said, some of our friends to have some heartburn. Certainly my dentist yeah, did For too. contrast, Jeff, you want to show them Alan Bates? Yeah, I, I should do that. I really, just, let's be fair. There's Alan. He's at 25, okay? He's not as bad as some of the Portland uh, Democrats, many of whom I served with. Uh, he's bad enough, but not as bad as these folks. Now here's what's interesting is this guy, Arnie Roblin, from Coos Bay, I know really well. His office used to be next to mine when he was in the House. And he's a pretty moderate Democrat. I mean, you'll sit down and talk with him, uh, and, and he'll seriously consider, and, and he's persuadable on, on many issues. Whereas you can sit down with Al, and Al's going to have his mind made up. Peter Buckley will have his mind made up on things. And certainly um, some of these folks right here. So anyway, it's, um, it's an interesting way we do that, but again, it, it creates... So when you come up with a score, is every bill that got rated given the same weight in terms of coming up with these numbers? The algorithm, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that, because I'm not the genius that put together the algorithm, okay? Some may be more important than others. I, I honestly don't know what the weighting okay. factor okay. is there. I, I, I can't answer that. I wish I could. Um, I'll try to make note of that to figure out how to do that. Because the guy who did this is a newly elected member of the House of Representatives. Yeah. Okay, Mike Nierman. All right. Very conservative guy. Uh, and, and, and I don't know. I, I know that he has some other interesting algorithms he's placed within the system, but I'll share with you uh, in, in a moment. So let's say that um, you have joined OCL and you have a username and a login. So this is mine, it's jeff.crup, and I have a password, and so I click login, and it brings up uh, some additional screens. I can contact the webmaster, my profile, my to-do list, my committee selections, lobbying my representatives, signing a bill to an analyst, because I'm listed as a team leader, if you weren't a team leader and just an analyst, you wouldn't see these right here. You would see all of these, but you wouldn't see these. Okay? So, uh, a better one for me to show you is, I'm going to log out and log in as, this is my buddy. Anybody know Bob Soap? So, this is one of Bob's aliases, and he and I share a password. Okay, so here's his profile. Okay, so that's his email address. This is his house district. Uh, you can change your password, you can save it, whatever. Okay, so that's his profile, you can manage that. You can have a to-do list, but first I probably should show you the committee selection. So he chose a number of committees, and that's what this looks like. So these are joint ways and means committees, and all you have to do is put a little check mark here. And you can be subcommittee on human services, subcommittee on natural resources. So if you're a farmer like me, and I used to sit on this subcommittee, I used to also sit on general government. Uh, you would hear, if, if, if you're interested in ODF&W's budget, 
If you're interested in uh, forestry's budget, those types of things, what are they spending their money on, you can review that by being a member of that committee because you'll automatically get their budget bills and you'll be able to see the line items and what they're proposing to spend money on. So in this case, my buddy went down here through the Senate and the House and he got down here to these committees right here. So he put his check marks. So he's House Health Care. So health care bills that go to the House committee, he's on that committee. He'll get an opportunity to analyze some of those bills. Same thing with judiciary, revenue, tax increases come out of revenue, sunsets, those kinds of things. Judiciary, all the laws having to do with um, the law and changing the law, the process of the law, judges, those kinds of things go through judiciary. House rules, that's the most dangerous committee in the building along with the Senate Rules Committee. And there's a reason why, because the Rules Committee is heavily stacked in favor of whatever the Speaker of the House wants on the House side, or the President of the Senate on the Senate side. So if you're the chairman of that committee, or if you're on that committee, you will not vote no on anything your Speaker or uh, your Senate President says you will vote what happens if you do? You're off? Well, yeah, sometimes they, they kick you off. If it's a big enough deal, I've seen that happen. And so, if they ask you to be on rules committee, you just understand that you're expected to snap to attention, salute, and do whatever they tell you to do, even if you don't like it. Why be on a committee if you're just going to be a puppet? Yeah. Exactly. There's no reason. Exactly. Now, this is also the committee that stays open through the end of the legislative session. Because after a while, they shut all these committees down because they're not going to hear any more bills. Because it just takes time for this stuff to wind through. A bill gets introduced in the House, takes a while to get through a committee, and then it's got to be voted on in the House. If it gets voted on successfully, then it goes over to the Senate. It's got to get through their committees. they got to vote on it. And then if they, if they Senate made amendments that the House doesn't like, then they got to come together and they got to try and work it out. All that takes time. And, so about the middle part of April, they're shutting committees down. When I was chairman of the House Ag Committee for two sessions, about the middle part of April, I had to have all my bills out that I was going to hear because they were going to cut my committee off. And that's a good thing. Uh, the longer these people are there, the more mischief happens, I can assure you. So Back you when choose. You, when you first started, yeah. it sounded like you might. If I were interested in education, I would put my name in the pool for education. Right. How, why or how would I even know to look at all of these? Be, because if, if you want to be an analyzer, they'll uh, make you an OCL member and they'll give you a, a login and a password. Okay. And then you can come in and create your profile and you can choose how many committees you want to be on. If you just want to be on education, just mark education. Okay, so I don't have to pick a committee. Yeah, yeah you, you, you will. You'll, you'll have to pick a committee. Yeah. Or several if you want. It's all up to you. So I'm sitting here thinking, how would I even know which committee is relevant to education? Other than I'll see the word education. Right. That, that's the only way you know. Okay. So there's House Education, okay. Senate that's Education. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and I recommend if you have life experience in a particular area like education, let's just take that. Uh, that's, that's what we value, and that's, that's what we need. Uh, because we need people who have lived it to be able to read the legislation and judge it based on their life's experience and what they know and our five principles, core, core principles, and tell us, is it good bill, is it bad bill? How good is it? How bad is it? We'll get in a moment. Yes, and then him. But in judging the bill, you would be using, you could use your personal life experience or professional experience, but would you cite that in your ratings or you just say up or down? You could, because you, you I'll, I'll show you in a minute, you can write narrative. Because I have a whole lot of junk on how preschool education is not significant and does it resort. Okay, so there's, there's a great example on, yeah. on where you're, and you could cite those things uh, as you analyze and review a bill. Okay. <coughs> 
<coughs> yes, sir. Well, I can see this is really a problem because uh, look who you got there this year. I mean, you got Coach yeah. Jackson, Courtney. I mean, they are idiot locks all the way through. That's right. So if you sign up for these things and they know you, say you've been there like you, they right. wouldn't want you on anything. Well, here, here's the thing is that these are not legislative committees. These are our committees. No, no, no. I mean, yep. at, at the actual uh, workings of the government. Oh, you mean at, at, at the legislature at in the, the war room? Not here. Obviously, you're trying to, you're trying to right. persuade somebody on that committee. But if they say, you're going to vote the way I want to, and you guys all know that going on to this thing, I, it's stacked. Sometimes it is. Uh, th that's why the, pre uh, the, the, the part, sometimes it is, okay? So sometimes your testimony is only um, show and tell yep. because they've already decided how they're gonna vote. Now that doesn't always happen, however. Mm -hmm. I have seen votes changed and committees have to go into recess, because I know it had to happen to me, uh, on a bill that you know we 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 counted the votes, we knew that's for, there's two first rules of first two first rules of politics. You know it's oxymoronic, but know how to count how to count votes, whether you're running for election or you're serving and you're trying to get something passed, and then don't tick off your base, mm -hmm. a la Monica. Okay, so the the reality is is that sometimes. Uh, your testimony can have an enormous impact. And sometimes, going, not just testifying, but going and lobbying a legislator, even if it's not your legislator, but they're, they're on a committee that's going to vote on something that's gonna impact your life, that's where you go there and you do those four things in a private conversation with them. That's where you, you tell them who you are, why you're there, the principle, tell them a story. If, you know, if they're gonna vote on something, I'll give you a great example. The, the, the dredge miners, uh, two sessions ago in 2013, there was bills there to limit their ability to go dredge, and they showed up in mass, and we trained them, and most of those people had never done anything like it, never talked to a legislator. But their ox was going to get gored big time. Now they care. So we trained them as best we could, and I saw them passionately and intelligently engage legislators and turn that thing around, at least for a while anyway, okay? So it, it does work, and sometimes, uh, even if it's not your legislator, you can have an impact on them. And it's so important to do that, because they'll, you know, most of these people are pretty good people, and they'll listen to reasonable arguments, and if you tell them a story about how this is impacting you, that, that gets them to step back for a moment, because you gotta remember who they're listening to. They're listening to the lobbyist over here who thinks this bill's a good idea. They're listening, in the case of the dredgers, they're listening to the environmental groups, right? Okay? Even though there's this incredible evidence that these guys who dredge clean up the riverbeds, yeah. and they have all, the, I mean, these guys brought in bags of trash to show as exhibits in, in the committee hearings. It was really, it was great. It was a great visual. Okay? And, and so there, the legislators are listening to this side over here, and if, and if the dredgers never show up, Guess what's going to happen? Well, legislators are going to say, well, nobody thinks it's a bad idea. These people say it's a good idea. I'm going to vote for it. Now, that's, of course, because many of them don't stand on their principles. So that, that, does, does that answer your question? You can make a difference. And, and this, this is effective at times. Yes, that particular bill, I, I guess I was under the impression that it passed. Um, it did eventually. Yeah, it did eventually. It did eventually. We, we stopped it for a while. So how many times, when it stopped, is it just tabled so there's no action on it at the moment, but the minute right. your back is turned, they right. try it out again and pass it. Right. And Mr. Bates was not listening. Right. Dr. Bates was not listening. Eternal vigilance is necessary if you're going to preserve your liberty. Truly. And that's a prime example of that. I've seen bills that were dead get resurrected in the final hours at two or three o'clock in the morning when you've been there for two days straight with virtually no sleep. 
and a bill gets resurrected because somebody cut a deal to get their vote to finally get the thing over with and the pain be over with and people rummy and they make bad decisions. I've seen that. It's an interesting management tool from leadership and it works. You wear people down, right? They get tired, they're, they're frustrated, they want to kill somebody, you want to throttle, strangle somebody. And your emotions are hot, you're worn out, and you're frazzled, and you say, all right, fine, I'm done, I'm out of here. Yeah, I'll vote for it, great. Okay, and, and people make decisions like that sometimes at the end of a legislative session. And I've seen those kinds of bills get resurrected, they get pulled out of committees. If you think a bill is dead, it's never truly dead. And the reason I say that is because the speaker or the Senate president can take a bill that was in my committee that I never heard, that I wasn't going to hear, because I didn't like it, and they gave me the ability to do that as a committee chair. They could take that, they could literally have my committee reconvene and tell me, you're going to vote that bill out of committee because we need the relating clause and we're going to gut and stuff it, you'll learn that term. Um, and so you're going to convene your committee, you're going to go in and you're going to do one thing, and it's a one hour notice, so it's two o'clock in the morning, you give a one hour notice, who's hanging around the building at two o'clock in the morning? A few of the lobbyists who know better, and legislators, and unfortunately staff, who are as frazzled and as worn out as we are. And you vote that thing out of your committee, it goes to rules committee, Okay, and they gut and stuff it in there and they put whatever language they want in it there and then it gets passed out. I've seen bad bills get pulled out of committee in the early wee's hours in the morning and not get gut and stuffed and just be part of a deal, part of a package called a Christmas tree bill. Where everybody gets a Christmas present. You buy somebody off with something they want in their district to get their vote. That's why they call it a Christmas tree bill. So, yes, um, these opportunities exist, and you choose exactly which ones you want to be on. Okay? Now, let's look at your to-do list. In this case, he has He has an analysis that somebody else has done as a team leader that he needs to review. He also has, based on his committees he's chosen, some bills assigned to him. Now, he assigned these to himself because he's his own team leader. But if you were just an analyst, your to-do list would have a list of bills here. Now, what's interesting about how we're doing it now is that sometimes people sign up and they get started and then something changes and they get busy doing it and they're not able to get through some bills that really need to get analyzed. So the way we've done it now is that if this sits in your to-do list over a period of time, it'll get rotated to somebody else's to-do list and you'll get a new set of bills. Okay, so somebody gets a chance uh, to analyze it. All right? So let's, let's look at this. This one has already been analyzed. So let's just double click on that. I gotta move over here to the right. Review the bill analysis. Okay? Alright. So up here at the top, you can go to the actual text of the bill. If I click on that, the actual bill would come up and you would see it. And it'd be on the state's website. Because again, we're linked to it. So this is the legislative summary that the legislature puts on this particular bill. This is what it did. Okay? And this is relating to, that's the relating clause. By Oregon's constitution, every bill has to have a relating clause. What is it related to? And I learned a hard lesson early on. That if your relating clause is really broad, like relating to underage persons, boy, you could do a lot of things with that relating clause. You could gut and stuff that bill. You could take all the language out of that bill and put some other language in there that was in entirely different than the person who introduced the bill thought it was going to be. And so that's why you write narrow relating clauses, which is what they've done here, relating to allowing underage persons access to prohibited items. So the person who uh, reviewed this 
reviewed it. Yes vote is the correct vote. And they said, well, on a scale of one to 10, yeah, that, that's a four being, you know, that, that's a pretty decent yes vote, okay? If it had been like a really, really, really strong yes vote, we got a vote on this, it'd be like a 10, a nine or a 10, okay? So you scroll down and you'll see this is the impact summary here. And so the idea with this is you must begin with lowercase letter and an action verb. Okay, so reduces penalty. Try to summarize in plain language what the bill does and what its impact is like this. Limits freedom of commerce by taxing chipmunk pelts. That's just an example. That's the weird humor of the guy who wrote all this stuff, by the way who's now a state representative. All right. Okay. So here's, here's what, this is the impact summary based on the impact that the reviewer thought it had. This is not a legislative summary. This is from the reviewer, the analyzer. Reduces the penalty for providing a device used to use tobacco pipes and for the first offense of unintentionally selling alcohol to a minor from class A misdemeanor to a class A violation. Third conviction is still a misdemeanor. This version includes housekeeping, cleanup items for clarification. Okay, so that's just kind of the summary of it. And then here's the personal choice. Remember, we've got to judge it on five, right? Well, it may not be appropriate for all five. It may be appropriate for one or for two or maybe three. It just depends on the legislation. Sometimes a bill may actually have a conflict between one or more of, of our five principles. Okay, now that gets really interesting uh, when that happens, and we've had examples of that. So here it is, personal choice responsibility. It slightly lessens the first offense from a misdemeanor to a violation, but still holds repeat offenders accountable by maintaining third offense as a misdemeanor. So that's what this reviewer wrote, all right? That was their own language, and that's the only thing they did on this bill. They didn't do anything free markets because it doesn't really apply. Fiscal responsibility, limited government, local control. And now there's a place that you can put confidential comments. The only people who will see this uh, will be one of our lobbyists for OCL or another analyst, but not the general public. So, so you, could, you could say general comments here about um, this bill was introduced by my Senator Alan Bates, who still doesn't get it. I mean, you, you could write all kinds of interesting things there if you wanted to. We, you know, we ask people to, you know, keep it reasonably clean and so forth. But you, could, you can write confidential things that not everybody's going to see there, okay? Uh, if you think it's important uh, for the team leader, because the team leader has to review all of these bills that were assigned to uh, his team's analyzers and has to basically sign off on them, make sure that grammatically correct and, and that it, it isn't really crazy one way or the other, okay? So that's an example of how a bill, uh, what a bill looks like once it's been reviewed. Now, the only person who can change this stuff is if it gets re-reviewed for some reason, uh, or the team leader, if they've got to edit it, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, if it's, if this bill was something that the team leader really disagreed with, they might reassign it and have somebody else on their team review it also and see what the differences might be, and to give that team leader a sense of well, was the first analyzer really just off base on this one? Or am I off base on this? Okay? So that's, it's, it's important that we have that kind of, of a review process because frankly, we don't want to be, we have to have some credibility too. We don't want to be doing dumb things in terms of reviewing that is really out there or just doesn't make sense. So that's this particular bill. Now we go back to the to-do list. So new bills to analyze. So we'll go to this one. 
Okay. So this is how this comes loaded. So if you're, this is the introduced bill. So it automatically has the bill number, has the text, has the legislative summary and the relating to clause. Um, I don't know why there's a, I think it's just the default is no, right? Uh, so there's no impact store, score, there's no impact summary, because this bill has not been reviewed yet. So you can see nothing's been done as I scroll down on this particular view. So if this were your, your bill and you were going to review it, you would need to read the bill, start judging it on the five core principles based on your life experience, based on your understanding of what this document is, what core principles mean, your life experience in this particular area or not, just what you really believe is right, <coughs> ethical and correct. And you can, you can write those things, you can put in confidential comments, and then you can save. All right, and then when you're, when you're done, because you know, maybe you want to do part of it now and it's time to go cook dinner, you come back, you want to finish it. Or maybe you want to sleep on it overnight, right? Because you're not really sure you want to say that that way, so maybe you want to look at it in the morning and have you know, fresh eyes and maybe take another shot at it, okay? So then you would click finish, and then it's done, and it goes to your team leader, and your team leader will review it and go through it. And uh, then when it's ready to publish, team leader publishes it, and then it's up on our website, and it's a reviewable bill. So this bill, which is House Bill 4061 from 2014, um, let, let's say this was House Bill 4061 from this session, 2015. As soon as one of us would review it, anybody could go on our website and search for a House Bill 4061 and see our comments and our review and the impact score and the impact summary on okay? So that's, that's briefly uh, kind of how it works. Uh, and you can go to lobbying your representatives. That's the other. So the good thing here is that if there were bills that were in, say, Sal Esquivel's committee or Al Bates' committee, uh, they would show up here. So you know what whatever committees they sit on, so Senator Bates sits on Senate Health, okay? I don't know what bills or committee Sal is on right now, but you would see the bills that are being assigned to their legislative committees that they're on. And that's good because you get to, uh, you get to track and watch the bills that they're looking at also. And it's kind of a, a great way of you being able to see it. So a couple of other quick things about this is I was asked a great question yesterday. How do we keep from being infiltrated by someone who is not really with us but wants to cause mischief, right? Well, this goes back to the algorithms and the guy that put this together is a software designer by trade. That's what he does for a living. Okay. So if you're an analyzer and you analyze a bunch of bills and, and they're not really within our five core principles um, and the team leaders look at them and scratching their head going, man, I don't get that. And, and they reassign them and that type over time. The system, I don't know how he did it, but he put in place a recognition that it, as an analyzer, if your bills, if you're not analyzing those bills well and they're not scoring well, the system ultimately just shuts you up. Uh, it will, you just won't get any more bills. You'll still be able to log in and so forth, but you won't be able to analyze any bills because you're not going to get any. Okay? So it's... That's one of the ways that we know. The other part of the vetting process is, is that when you sign up and say, I'm going to join OCL, I want to be on the education committee, 
Uh, we ask our team leaders to contact you typically by email and, and just say, hey, welcome to the team. Tell me a little bit about yourself and why do you want to be on this committee and you know, what's your interest here uh, with doing it. So that, what they'll do is they'll do just a very slight vetting process. They'll look you up on Twitter, look you up on Facebook and Google your name and make sure you're not an ax murderer who broke out of jail in North Carolina and, you know, thumbed your way here and now you're hanging around state legislators and you want to come to the war room and, uh, you know, just stuff like that. Or if you're a, a lefty and you have, a, you know, profiles out there on lefty websites or you've written things that are out there, because the internet's forever, right? And if you're a lefty and you've written under your real name and you know, some of that stuff will show up, and it's not hard to do that. It's just a cursory examination to, uh, to just make sure that you're really kind of who you say you are. Because we, what we're really looking for are people who really want to do this and take the time to read through legislation, judge it on our criteria, and rate it. So that we have something then that we can, at the war room, if, 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 Say we have an education bill that has two charter schools. I happen to be the chairman of the board of the state's largest charter school in this state. It's an online public charter school with 3,760 students, K through 12. And if there's a bill that has to do with online charter schools, and there already are, okay, uh, the war room needs to know that. So when that bill is winding its way through the legislative process, if it's been analyzed and we see it on the schedule, we'll quickly go look at the analyzer's comments on it, look at the impact score, impact summary. If it's a bad bill for online charter schools, someone will have recognized and will have said why. You know, is it limited government? Is it ensconcing common core, which is not limited government by any stretch of the imagination? Which unfortunately we have to comply with common core. The state of Oregon said we did, and we're a public charter school. So if if those we need to know that in the war room so that we then can literally write up a script, which was on that other website, actual testimony, and send people who come to the war room to literally go sit in front of that committee and go testify. Maybe somebody's passionate about uh, education, or maybe somebody who isn't what's willing to go with somebody who is and kind of back them up and say, yeah. Or go find a legislator that sits on that committee and catch them in the hallway. And say, hey, I'm Jeff Krupp from the Oregon Citizen Lobby, and we usually wear these little buttons around so people know who we are. I'm Jeff Krupp from the Oregon Citizens Lobby, and I'm one of your constituents, or I'm not one of your constituents, but this bill really affects my charter school, and this is this is Jack Atkins from Medford, and he is one of your constituents, and he cares about this legislation too. And then we have the opportunity to talk, and so we need to know, that's why we need to have critical pieces of legislation that are analyzed. That's why we need more analyzers, so we can get those bills done. The RCC library will close in 15 minutes. So, that's, that's my cue, isn't it? So my... My hope is that you've seen something here that you find interesting enough uh, and relatively simple enough to get involved with that you think you uh, can join us and contribute either come to Salem. Uh, War Room is every Thursday in the same room, room 243. There will be two Thursdays where it'll be, they'll be on Wednesday, but it's usually every Thursday. And it's all day long. Typically we have coffee and I usually get somebody to sponsor a box lunch, so there's a little bit of food there, coffee and water, and, and it's a great opportunity. There's usually 10, 15, 20 of us, sometimes more, depends if it's a really big issue that a lot of people are spun up about. They'll, uh, they'll come in and, and we'll, get, we'll be watching legislation on our laptops. We'll be watching committee hearings. We usually have the projector up there, and if there's an interesting committee hearing or floor session, We'll have it up on the screen. We'll be looking at legislation. We'll be talking about it. We'll be talking about what do we like about it, what do we, we don't like about it, what should we do about this. And we'll literally write out a testimony right there and people will practice it and then we'll send them out. And right then and there, you have an opportunity to go make a difference if you come to work. Yes, ma'am? Who funds this organization? 
We are uh, self-funded. Uh, I. Uh, our various organizations, like Oregon Capital Watch Foundation, I pay for the room. Uh, Freedom Works is going to support us with uh, some of the refreshments. Uh, so a couple of local businesses uh, support with the, the refreshments also. And that's it. I mean, it's just, it's all, we're, we're not an organized organization where anybody gets paid. It's just... So you're independent and wealthy, you don't need to... No, I wouldn't say we're independently wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we, we don't have any money. I'm not accusing you, I just... Yeah, no, I, that's... So, this, we'll use this projector, and it's being, the use of it is from Representative Mike Nearman, who's the guy who uh, designed this website. He lets us use it for free. It's just everybody kind of pitching in together as volunteers. What, what are the, kind of the, the big numbers? How many bills, and then how many actually get voted on, and how many do we review, and so forth? There will be uh, well over 3,000 bills introduced in the, the session, mm -hmm. and about uh, about 2,000 of them will actually get a committee hearing, and uh, they'll end up voting on about a thousand of them. Usually, a thousand become law. 800 to a thousand. Yes. At this time, how many people do you have signed up? We have about 300 people that are OCL members, but we only have, oh, Jack, I think it's 60, 50 or 60 people that are actually bill analyzers, and it's oh, not man. enough. Because mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot of bills coming through. Um, yeah, yes, sir. Well, how does the, uh, I'm curious to see, because you were, you were there. Yeah. If, how does, uh, how many staff members does, say, Bates get or you got or, and obviously, they're going to be the like-minded thinking people. So they're going to go yes. through these bills, obviously. Yeah, they're going to say, hey, this is good. This limits everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, they're obviously opposite. Sure. So how do they get informed to pass all these stupid things that they can't even read? I mean, our whole U.S. Senate don't read anything. I don't know how they do. Yeah. Um, well, this a, is terrible. A, 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 a great go. question. And here's how it works in practice, is you're allowed you get X amount of dollars to run your office and you can hire as many people for those dollars as you can. So typically what you try to do is find a chief of staff who's had some experience in the process and, and can help you work through the bills and has relationships. Uh, and then maybe you have enough money left over for a part-time uh, policy analyst person. And then you rely on interns uh, people from your legislative district, or maybe uh, political science uh, students at Willamette University next door, or maybe uh, from Lane Community College, I used to get conservatives come up to uh, be an intern for me one day a week uh, in their poli science uh, class, their political science class there, uh, because there weren't, there weren't any Republicans from the Eugene area, <laughs> and this particular college professor knew me, and uh, uh, he, and he was a Democrat, had a ponytail, great guy, we had, we had uh, great debates, and he just still loved the guy to this day. But he would send me these kids uh, to be interns, and they would come and intern in my office and do some of the things that need. They would look up bills, they would kind of analyze bills, we would teach them how to do that, because most of these college kids are pretty bright and so forth. And then every now and then we'd get people come in off the street, folks uh, who maybe retired or out of work or looking for something to do that had a passion for politics, Want to come in and intern, and sometimes I'd have them go down and sit down in committee hearings on an important bill that I cared about that I couldn't be at, and have them take notes, and then write me up a, a report that I would, you know, review later. And so you're given about one and a half staff people, so you rely on interns and volunteers to help you. You so your staff will rely on the lobbyists who come and lobby for or against on a bill, and sometimes you'll have people who supported you in the lobby on opposite sides of a piece of legislation, that happens a lot. And they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna sit down with you, or they're gonna sit down with your chief of staff, and they're gonna say, 
they're going to give you a little one pager and they say, this is why this is a good bill or this is why this is a bad bill. And your staff will write that down and they'll put it in. Uh, every bill has a little manila folder like this where there's a copy of the bill in it and there's all the stuff you get for or against. So you get that and if it's a really it's a controversial bill, one that is maybe has stirred up a lot of people in your legislative district, mm -hmm. then all the people that got stirred up, their emails and their phone calls and notes, all that stuff's going to be in your bill file. And if it's controversial enough, your staff will sit and say, all right, so it's coming up, you know, it passed out of this committee, so it means it's going to be on the floor in a couple of days. We need to talk about how you're going to vote on this thing. Now, I may have already decided or not, okay, just based on my principles as a legislator and what I you know, believe are right. So you rely on different sources. And of course, now today, we're relying on you know, technology and the internet far more than we ever had. When I was in the legislature, you couldn't have a laptop on the floor of the House or the Senate. Now you can. So you can look up bills and you can Google things you know, right there. Whereas I had to go to the back to the phone booth pick up the phone and call my office and say, hey, will you hurry up and uh, Google this real quick? <laughs> okay? Because we're not supposed to do that on our cell phones either. Uh, on, so, yeah. Why don't you bring up one of the ones like Columbia River Crossing? Because that was, that was a good example of work and really come together. And we did change a lot of votes. We, we did. House Bill 2800 was that multi-billion dollar bridge going across the Columbia the only reason it was a multi-billion dollar bridge is because the Portland Liberals wanted to force light rail on Vancouver who didn't want it, who had voted it down several times. All right? And so we joined an interesting, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows. Oh, yeah. Because we ended up joining with a lot of far left environmental groups for different reasons to try to kill the bill. Now we were unsuccessful at that because you know, there's billions of dollars at stake here for construction and firms and the people that were sucking at feeding at the trough, rather, uh, were, uh, were the ones who were hiring lobbyists. And there was something like 30 lobbyists hired, Republicans and Democrat lobbyists, to get Republicans and Democrats to vote for this turkey. And, I, and, that's, and I'm not exaggerating. In fact, I have a list of 36 of them that were hired. Okay. And they were spending taxpayer dollars to lobby, now, which is not really legal, but they were doing it anyway. They found a way to make that happen. So uh, we came together with the far left environmentalists who didn't want anything built, okay, period. They want congestion because that forces people out of cars, right? Because cars are evil and carbon is bad and those kinds of things from their point of view. And they didn't want to disturb the salmon in the river. Okay, so they didn't want anything built. We didn't want it built because it was completely fiscally irresponsible. Mm -hmm. I mean, totally fiscally irresponsible in so many ways. And it was nothing but crony capitalism. There was no free market about that. And I can go on and on and regale you with stories. <laughs> and they lied to the legislature and we mm -hmm. caught them lying. Uh, we had a forensic accountant who went in and caught uh, ODOT in the Washington Department of Transportation lying to their legislature also. I mean, it was an astonishing thing to see this happen. And even with all of that, we were unsuccessful at stopping it. But as Jack said, we took that knowledge and the analyzing the bills from our perspective of fiscal responsibility, of limited government, of free markets, because it, it was only crony capitalism was all that sucker was about. And we took that and we did change minds because we joined strange bedfellows with those lefties on the other environmental groups. And we on the conservative fiscally limited government side got some people to change their minds. So they had less votes than they thought they were going to have. Ultimately, they got it passed. And then we went to Washington and we killed it in Washington. Mm -hmm. By only, no, Washington State Legislature because yeah. they had to agree to it too. Yeah. Okay, and if they didn't agree to it, it didn't get built. And we only did that by two votes there. Yeah. What's interesting is the state of Washington said you can't build a bridge on our particular side of the river. 
Right. And charges told. So I thought that was fascinating. But it's still up for grabs again. It's probably starting out again. Well, they're, they're going to have a hard time with that because the federal government said, you know what, uh, you wasted almost $200 million of your money and federal government tax dollars, which is our gas tax dollars, right? That's all it is. And now you've got to pay us back. So Oregon's got to pay back something like $70 million and a like amount in Washington, and the rest of it was actually Washington funds and, and our funds there too. So, yes, sir? Another question. Now, you, the philosophical thing, you said you, you're a dentist. That may not be a good thing to be your dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about that. You know. But anyway, how could a guy that you say is conservative, using your interpretation, and he does, and it does not translate into votes? I mean, what happens between a conservative and going to a vote and if you're not a conservative voter? I mean, what happens in that process? You're swayed or you're, or you're not a conservative to begin with. We remember that we have five criteria. Right. Okay. So there's lots of folks who call themselves conservatives yeah. who don't judge themselves or certainly legislators on the bills they vote for based on those five things. They will say, uh, one of the most conservative is Senator Larry George. Senator Larry George sold out and voted for the gas tax increase in 2011 uh, because they were going to build a $300 million uh, parkway to get around that incredible nightmare if you've ever driven from Newburgh towards McMinnville on Highway 99 especially anywhere near 5 o'clock. It's, uh, it's like a L.A. freeway in, in a traffic jam. It's an amazing thing. So he sold his vote for that. Okay? He voted for against his principles, and he was laughing and joking about this the other day to me. Larry, if you ever see this, I love you, man, but principles are principles, dude. Uh, and he, he said to me, at least when I sell out, I sell out for something big. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it, never mind that the rest of us get to pay that gas tax too, you know, for on into uh, infinity. So there's a guy who has an incredibly conservative voting record, even by our standards mm -hmm. up there, who would occasionally vote for something. So how can my conservative dentist have a lower rating than somebody else? It is based on the bills that he voted for that we analyzed uh, and, and how he voted on them. I mean, he may have voted on enough of them to create that dynamic to where he actually didn't look that conservative compared to others. Now, compared to the Democrats, yes, he's still very conservative. But. Did you explain to him point by point? In other words, maybe he just does not understand. Your well, I, I recently had lunch with Fred, and we talked about this. Uh, because he voted for a billion dollar bonding bill that, by the way, uh, also allows bonds to be sold to build a government-run hotel at the Portland Convention Center that competes against private hotels. Next door. Why would he do that? Cut a deal. He cut a deal for something else. So. So, so there you go. I mean, that's, that's an example. There's another senator who's fairly high on that list that is going to be the recipient of some radio ads that I'm running tomorrow in his district and a newspaper ad and robocalls. Why? Because he voted for that silly bridge across the Columbia. He voted for two bills that made Obamacare the law of the land here in Oregon. Okay including that wonderful success called the Cover Oregon website. We spent three and five million dollars on a website that Start never worked. Now and two or three other things that were not conservative at all. And so we're going to run an ad against this guy in his district to let him know we're watching. When I was driving through Grants Pass, I got a call from the, uh, apparently the cat's out of the bag, because I got a call from the Chief of Staff to Senator Ted Ferrioli, who's the Republican leader in the Senate. And he wasn't very happy with me because mm. he 
found, he li just listened to the ad, because somebody had sent it to him, and they have a copy of it, and it starts tomorrow in the morning, and runs on four radio stations over in Pendleton and LaGrande, and so, um, you know, you do those things because you want to let his, you want to let his voters know how he voted, and the whole point of us doing that is to tell them how he voted, and by the way, he voted in favor, and the, the whole reason we're doing this is he voted in favor of illegal alien driver's licenses, okay? And one of his constituents about a month ago wrote a letter to the editor saying, you know what, he's so out of touch because it failed. In, he's in four counties he covers, and it failed by 80% was the lowest number. The highest number was 84%. Okay? And he voted for it. And so a constituent says he ought to resign because he's way out of touch. And so he writes this big, long rebuttal, which is the worst thing you could ever do as a, a legislator. But he's got an ego. And, and uh, so that, that really, we just decided, all right, it's time to make an example of somebody. Because how could, because he, and he said, I talked to everybody. I talked to advocates. The farmers wanted it. The, the business wanted it. The politicians wanted it. Everybody wanted this thing. How could you miss it that badly? Think about it. 80% average against you. Actually, higher than 80% average. How could you miss it that bad? He's out of touch. Listening to the wrong people. And that's the point we're making in this ad. And we're doing it for the purpose of firing a warning shot across the Republicans' bow. Because there's a lot of stuff on guns. There's a lot of stuff on carbon taxes. It's all kinds of stuff that some Republicans who are squishy, moderate Republicans, like this senator, might want to vote on. And we're going to send a strong message, because now they're all worried that they're going to have to go spend a bunch of money to defend him in a primary challenge against a real conservative. Okay, so now we got them worried. That's exactly what we want them to do. We want them to be worried about how they're voting, so they're going to stick to their principles. And if they do and they don't vote for that kind of stupidity, then they don't have anything to worry about. Yes? When these uh, representatives get elected, uh, they, they do something before they take the office, and that is they make a promise. They do. Okay. It's called they take an oath of office. Right. And the primary document that they swore allegiance to, if I'm not mistaken, is in that little brown book. It is. And the secondary document is the is what gets very little play, and that is the Oregon Constitution. Right. So, why is that? Because there are two specific documents, and why are they bypassing those documents that they publicly swear allegiance to? Because they forget. They forget. They forget why they're there. They forget what's their purpose. How can someone forget within hours? Because this is why I favor term limits. Because the longer you're there, the worse it gets. The more you forget. Uh, a smart term limit law, by the way. Um, because you're in a microcosm, a world, a bubble, if you will, that is unlike anything you've ever experienced. I know it certainly was for me. And you are being pulled in so many directions at such a fast pace that you have very little time to sit and think anything through. Okay? Yeah. So what you do is you listen to these arguments and, and you take an oath of office to serve. I mean, you, almost everybody I've ever served with, including some of the far lefty Democrats, go in with very noble reasons for serving. And, and that's good. And thank goodness they're willing to endure the slings and arrows of a campaign and the hard work and putting your life out there for everybody to see and comment on, especially today with social media. Um, they come in with noble reasons for serving. And very quickly it degenerates to um, partisan politics, ideological politics, pure political muscle to get something done, and the great example of that is the Columbia River Crossing Bridge, where you know 36 lobbyists were hired to push that thing through. And so 
suddenly this gets lost in the noise. The principles of limited government, everything articulated in these documents, including in Oregon's Constitution, gets lost in the noise of it all. And I am convinced that I, I can't venture to guess what the percentage would be of our laws passed at the state level and the federal level are unconstitutional, but my guess is that there is a substantive um, number that really are. That, and, and this was done because legislators get too busy. They forget what these principles are and what they really swore an oath to. I appreciate your honesty, and, and yep. there have been efforts made to enumerate legislation before it's actually debated and passed right. at the federal level, so why can't that be done at the state level? It could. Uh, it, it could. Uh, some would say, well, that's a separation of powers issue because you have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. And the judicial branch can't tell the legislative branch what to do, even though they do all the time, okay, which is unconstitutional in its own right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they say they can't legislate from the bench. They do all the time by the things they say. Okay. And Chief Justice John Roberts in the Obamacare ruling is a prime example of that. Okay. Saying something that's not even in the legislation. Um, so, we, uh, we have the need for us as people to stand up together as never before because there's about to be a bunch of really bad things happen for the values and principles that we believe in at the State Legislative Assembly. And I was talking to another representative uh, just as I was driving in here, uh, and he said, he said, you know, there's talk amongst our House Republicans that we ought to just stand together and let the other side vote whatever they're going to vote for, and we just vote no against it. Not a single Republican vote for any of these bad bills that are against our, let them own it. Let them own it all. And I said, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Because he then shared with me a story of another member who he didn't name, who it was, who told him last night, he said, you know, I voted for a couple of bills, and because, you know, I was trying to make a bad bill better, we call that polishing a turd. It's still a turd. Okay? And, you know, I'm still struggling if it was the right thing to do or not. Okay? And, and I said, you know what? If, if you stood firmly on your principles and values, you would have voted no. Because bad policy is bad policy no matter how you try to make it better. If it's bad, it's bad. Based on what? Values and principles things articulated in here, things we know to be true within our soul and our spirit as human beings, as free Americans. And if we are to stand against this, we have to come together. We have to be stronger. I need every one of you analyzing bills, and I mean that sincerely. I need, and we're, we're doing a lot of these all across the state for the next 30 days, and hopefully we can get another hundred people active analyzing bills and then we can analyze all the big bills that really do impact our values and our principles and we can use them. Yes ma'am. Um, you said about running ads yeah. starting tomorrow that cross money. Uh, are, have you any success in going to reporting the news media and getting them interested in a story? The facts or, some, um, some. Or are we completely shut out? No, we're, we're not. This is one of the interesting things that Governor Kitzhaber created for himself, a problem. Uh, and it wasn't Sylvia. Okay. I, I, I call her the first concubine. I'm sorry. She's not the first lady. And until they have that wedding ring on that finger, I'm sorry. That's how it happens. Right. So, um, when Governor Kitzhaber walked out of that Channel 2 interview, uh, which he had scheduled for 45 minutes after four minutes when they asked him the first question about Cover Oregon, they got mad at him. And they started covering him. They sent a film crew all the way down to Sacramento to Carolyn Lawson, who was the gal who ran the Cover Oregon disaster. 
okay, to interview her, and she's suing the state, and they went after John Kitzhub. And all of a sudden, Channel 2 started doing a segment about wasteful government spending, which is exactly what we do at Oregon Capital Watch Foundation. And so I started feeding them things that we had that previously, you know, we were thinking about publishing, but it just wasn't really sexy. It wasn't the kind of things. Remember years ago, uh, the 123-yard carpet in the archives building back in the mid-90s? It was Barbara Roberts, or early, early 90s, in there in Salem. Uh, $5,000 chandeliers, you know. Once that story broke, uh, it, was, it was when Measure 5 passed, I think it was in 1990, when that story broke, that here uh, all these politicians and these elected officials and government agencies are telling you that they're broke and they don't have enough money and you shouldn't vote for Measure 5 property tax limits and look at what they're spending. Look at the $5,000 chandeliers and 123-yard carpet. Do you have a 123-yard carpet in your house? And it worked. And that thing passed. And by the way, it's in the 20 some odd years since it passed, it saved Oregonians well over $20 billion in tax, uh, property taxes. Okay. So I share with you that story because usually the news media doesn't want to, especially in Oregon, you know, it's, they're kind of lefty, we're kind of progressive lefty. So there's not a lot of conservative news anchors out there in newsrooms. But now some of them are, the massive failure of Cover Oregon was so bad, $305 million, $200 million they blew on the, the bridge. They, they literally spent on engineering studies and lobbyists and they never turned a single shovel full of dirt. That's half a million dollars that laid at Governor Kitzhaber's feet. I mean, at half a billion dollars, 500 million. And the voters said, yeah, it's all right. We like John. We like Sylvia, apparently. So the, there is some hope for the news media. I, I think my fear is that if we don't, if enough of us on our side don't stand up through efforts like this and others to counter what they're hearing from the left media, the legislators, and the environmental lobbyist groups and the socialist progressive groups and all these groups that band together if we don't offer the counter on this side they're going they're going to make us california folks or worse or worse and yeah well folks are if you, i mean you probably know folks are moving out of california coming to oregon like crazy right now yeah i have a question that is yeah. The whole notion here is to try to influence legislation right. towards those five core principles. Now, certainly, you know, everywhere you can ship an or to, towards that in some way. Right? So you, you, you sign up as an analyst, you sit there, you do your deals, you do, you do this. Now, what you have here with Track Their Vote is basically just like you said, an infographic that says, you know, over time, this is the way that you voted. This. Okay, now what do you do with that? And how are you really influencing legislation? It's a bit of an embarrassment, perhaps, but to who? Okay, who's really watching this site except the choir? So if you're just preaching to the choir, what good are you doing? Now, the reason I'm paying all that sure. is preamble, if you will. Is there any efforts in place? Obviously, you have it through institutional knowledge and your own experiences. Is there any body of knowledge that says, here are, here are our legislatures. Here are the issues that are most important to them. Here are their pain and pleasure points. Do we have that body of intelligence anywhere? Because if I, if I want to be a lobbyist, and if I want to influence legislation, I need to know what's important to the people that are going to be the people most opposed to me. Because then I can appeal to their greater interests and help influence that legislation. Is there a body of intelligence like that? No. Okay. It lies within uh, every lobbyist who is a professional lobbyist who job is to get to know every legislator. Uh, for instance, the one representative who's a freshman that uh, was talking to me on the way in here, I helped get elected, uh, he said, I've, 
we ended morning meetings and I've been meeting with lobbyist after lobbyist after lobbyist who just wants to get to know me. So the intelligence is in each lobbyist who gets to know someone and, and that's why they take people out to dinner, to build relationship with them. So they get to understand how they think and what buttons do they push or can they push. That's that intelligence uh, that you're really referring to. And, and there is no comprehensive body of that. Now, that's a very interesting idea, by the way, of what you've just suggested by your question. Um, because wouldn't it be novel to do something like that? Because I've never seen that done. I've never seen anybody do it. Yet yeah, you have uh, groups that rate legislators just like we do, okay? But that doesn't really get to your, your core question. Uh, and and that's, that's a very interesting idea. And if you're okay, I'm going to answer that. Uh, because I think there's some interesting possibilities with that. And, and the reason I say that is because there's also some interesting new technology uh, that is relatively new to America. Uh, but it's actually been it was, uh, psychographic modeling that came out of Cambridge University in the early uh, 80s. I've been working with some folks on that. It's really fascinating to figure out not what people think, but how they process information. And to be able to market an idea or a comment or a product to them based on how they process that information. Not based on what just their personality type is, or what's their psychographic subgroup. I mean, it, it's some pretty fascinating stuff that's way over my head that these uh, gentlemanly sounding Englishmen were with PhDs behind their name were sharing with me. It would, wouldn't it be interesting to have some kind of analysis of legislators that created psychographic profiles? I'll guarantee you the CIA does, right? The FBI does, okay? Because that's that's part of what you have to do if you're in the forensics business, if you're in the invest, if, if they, a long time ago, they knew who Vladimir Putin was, okay? Because they have all kinds of psychographic models of this guy and how he thinks and what he's going to do based on his history and everything they know about him. And that's that predictive modeling. And that's really what you're getting at, is how do we take this stuff and we use it to its maximum impact based on how it's going to impact a legislator. So one of the things that psychographic modeling does, it helps you understand who might be the persuadables. I'm talking really about voters. But you could do the same thing with legislators. Who, which legislator might respond to this message on this issue if it was done this way? And maybe if the right groups of people, constituents or others, came and presented it that way. That's, that's really where this all needs to go, because that's maximum effectiveness. If you know that a particular issue really pushes a legislator's hot buttons. The longer they're there, people know and people talk. The legislature is like junior high school on steroids for adults. It's like it's backbiting and talking and I mean, it, it's just, it's everything you hated about junior high school is what the legislature is, okay? Uh, and after a while, you know how people are and how they think and what they're gonna do and. So people, and you'll notice the legislators will start coming to you and sort of framing an issue a particular way because they know that you're, you're going to respond to that a little bit better. It'd be great if we, the lay people, we the people, had access to some kind of a psychographic modeling where we would then, I mean, it would be a great tool for me at the war room to be able to say, on that carbon tax bill, who are the legislators that would respond to a message if it were done this way by these people? You might have a very hard ideologue on a particular issue, okay? But that person still needs to garner support. Right. And the thing is, is you may be able to be effective here at this level and nibble away at that base of support to ultimately you erode that basis of support where even that person is a hard ideologue on a particular issue no longer has the support that they used to have. Right. 
And it really comes down to what I would call really two areas. You have estimative intelligence, which would be what you're talking about in tracking the boats. Mm -hmm. Then you have predictive intelligence. Right. Two different elements. But yeah. estimative intelligence is pretty cut and dry. Predictive intelligence is kind of like, which way is that legislation going to go? Legislation right. going to go? And why? And what can we do to influence that? That's, that's why I'd like to see us go. And, and if, if we could figure out how to do that in a simplistic way so that average folks like me and you could take advantage of that, it would be incredibly powerful. I mean, it really would. Because then you could sit at your home in your computer and you could develop an email message or you could make a phone call. Now the key is that, uh, who does the legislature really read the email? And, does, and will the legislature take your phone call? Because if, if you're really trying to get to the mind of an, and the heart of a legislator, then that means you're not, you shouldn't be talking to the chief of staff. That's why eyeball to eyeball, whether it's back when they're in district on the weekends and they're holding a town hall meeting or you say, hey, when you're back in your district next weekend, I'd like to have a cup of coffee with you. And then you get to be eyeball to eyeball with them and that's when you have that opportunity. And by the way, that's a great way to have personal interaction and get to know your legislator, even if it's Al Bates or Peter Buckley and you know they're opposite of you on just about everything, but who knows, you might have one area of common ground. And it's worth it to do exactly what you said, to develop that relationship and be able to chip away. Because you never know. You just don't. Because sometimes legislators are funny animals. They'll just do something you didn't expect. And that's good. Most of the time. Sometimes it is. Uh, last couple of questions and then we got to get out of here. Actually, I got to get home. Because it'll be one o'clock by the time I get home. Yes, sir. Did you know Rush Walker? I know Russ very well. Okay. Uh, talked to him last week, as a matter of fact. Pardon? I talked to him last week, as a matter of fact. Oh, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago. But uh, uh, he used to have bus loads of us from a uh, bus load from Klamath Falls, and one from Minford, one from Grants Pass. Mm -hmm. And we'd go up to the legislature and, and uh, <coughs> say our piece up there. If, uh, if I could find the money to do that, we need to do that again. Because it. it Believe me, it, it does make a difference. Well, ask Russ how he did it. Yeah. Well, it was Freedom Works or Citizens for Sound right. Economy first and then right. Freedom Works. And yeah. Yes, ma'am? I think an earlier point that you made was quite significant, and that is we must not have people who, for whom the legislature is their full time career. Right. We can't have these inherited positions where someone's serving there for a hundred years and they will be with the new developments on physiology and whatever. So we must find some way of switching these people out in the Constitution it was never intended, intended to be Absolutely correct. lifetime work. And if you have someone who's been there longest, they're all going to look toward the person who's been there longest and nothing changes. That's been the problem with a lot of Republicans in the past. They wait, it's, if I wait long enough, all ascend into the leadership. Right. We have newer people, fresher people, and I think we need to reevaluate some of these. I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, if you have good staff and a good process of orientation, your first couple of months, I remember when I, my first legislative session, I was in a fog, because it was incredibly busy. And you had people lined up outside your door every 15 minutes, you were, uh, and people were talking to you as you were rushing to your next committee hearing, and you know, you're trying to keep up with constituents' calls and looking at all these bills and the complication of it all. And it was, it was incredibly difficult. Well, the other thing is, do the elected players change, but the staffs remain in place? Right, mm -hmm. and, and so they do, the professional kind of, staff. You don't know your law from Betty Boop. And, and they so gain, believe me, staff gains you. Yeah. They, 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 they play legislators. I know I've been the victim of that. Not in a bad, bad way, but, you know, they're the professionals. They're professional paid staff there to work for the legislature, whether they're the lawyers or the CPAs or the forecasters. You know, they all have this professionalism, and they're very good at it, but they also protect their turf and their ideology and it enters into their analysis of bills and how they prepare things for you. And 
so that we we just have to I, I am convinced that as new people come into the system with a commitment to this to their values and principles that they will maintain that for a time period before the system pulls them away from those values and principles. Now, I actually went, did in the reverse of that. I served eight years in the House of Representatives. In my first couple of years, I got a, or my first two terms, four years, I didn't really know where I stood here. I wish there had been a movement like this when I first got elected. Because I would have done some things differently. I certainly would have voted differently. I certainly would have tried to advocate for some things differently. Because I hadn't read the Constitution a long time when I got elected. I sw swore my oath of office. I couldn't tell you the stuff I had highlighted. And I wish I had. So my journey was a little different. I started conservative, immediately began to be pulled to the middle away from my principles. In about my fourth year, the deal I made with my wife, she let me run, was when I start sounding like the people I yell at on television, did you need to tell me it's time to quit? It was about that fourth year. She said, you know what you said to me? You're starting to sound like those people. So I got to thinking. And I, I realized I was really at a junction, and I'll leave you with this. I was really at a junction in where I could go back to my conservative principles and values and stand firmly on them, or I could go on the machine. Because I had people saying, you know, Portland business people, Portland lobbyists saying, you know, we think you have a real future in politics. <laughs> Which is what they say to everybody, right? A real wealthy and you know, there, there, there's a group of us, you know, we, we, we're really looking for someone who's conservative like you to take a leadership role and advocate for things like, you know, increasing taxes because we have this incredible need in education. That's what the former speaker, Republican speaker of the Oregon House came to me and said to me. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. And so I had this choice to make. Was I going to go on the star maker machine, or I go up the next Republican to the next office up, and then the next office up? And I had visions of that because I was listening to all of that. All of a sudden, I was important. I was somebody. All these people were calling me representative. They want to take me to dinner and Blazers games and Seahawks games and all these wonderful things we got to do. And I realized. That I was going away from everything I believed as to why I ran for office. To me. The reason I ran for office is because I got tired of government telling me how to run my farm. That's it. So I made a choice. I made a choice to go back to my principles and values. Immediately fell off the star maker machine because I started voting against everything <laughs> just about. And they're still telling you how to run your farm. And, and when I call up, or when I, when I run ads to hold Republicans accountable for bad votes against their principles and against the principles of the Constitution, I get chiefs of staff who call me up and say, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing what I believe is right. Amen. And I'm glad I did. Amen. So with that, my friends, uh, we would love to have every one of you join us. Uh, you can sign up at the sign-up sheet. We'd love to get you on our alerts and let you know what we're doing, what's going on. It's easy to go to the website and uh, sign up. Because all you do is you go right here to how we can help, how can you help, and you click on that little video right there that says how to join OCL. Well, you can't because it's not showing. So anyway, it, it, it's, it's just how to join OCL. It's very simple. You can do it online. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attentiveness. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.